Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2023. Lesson 5 from the series on the book of Ephesians is titled Horizontal Atonement, the Cross and the Church. It's ready for teaching on July 29. The author is John McVeigh and your reader today is Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, July 22. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the story of the gospel exhibited in the life of Jesus who came as a baby, lived as a young man, as a a saviour he died and then he rose again that each of us could have eternal life and he now is there for us on a daily basis lord we thank you for all of this and as we open your word and refresh our minds and learn new things from the book of ephesians this week we pray that not only will we be intellectually stimulated but that our hearts may see and know that you are the god who loves us and cares for us and is so gracious to Toward us. And today I'd like to pray for Alice Beck in Australia, Hope Bennett, for Sharon Meyer and her husband Mike in Ohio, for Gabriel John, for Mkenya Horosi in Kenya in Africa, for Fernando Gorski, for Stephanie Cavallo in Brazil, for Farouk Mohammed in Trinidad, for Anne Marie Edwards. In, and those who are listening who are blind in Horsham and Port Moresby and Honiara and the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific, Lord, wherever we're listening, we pray that today may be a high day as we re-establish our relationship with you through your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 13 and 14. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one. Let's read that again, Ephesians 2, verses 13 and 14. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one. You are a Gentile, a Greek, who has learned to treasure the God of the Jews. In fact, you have left your worship of many gods and have embraced the one true God. As you make your way through the beautiful courtyards and fluted columns of the Jerusalem temple, the sounds of worship call forth your praise. Just then, though, you find yourself confronted by a stone barricade four feet high. Engraved every few feet in Latin and Greek is this message. No foreigner may enter within the barrier and enclosure around the temple. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuring death. In that moment, you feel shut out, alienated and separated. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 22, which we'll study this week, Paul sees the cross of Christ as making a dramatic difference, destroying such barriers and walls. Vertically, the cross dissolves alienation, reconciling humans with God. Horizontally, it reconciles people with each other. The cross removes enmity, and brings peace between Jews and Gentiles, making of them one new humanity, as we'll read in Ephesians 2.15. Together they become a new temple, a dwelling place for God by the Spirit, as we read in verse 22. What does this truth mean for us today? Sunday, July 23, brought near in Christ. Compare Ephesians 2, verses 1, 2 and 3, Paul's earlier description of the Gentile past of the addressees, with Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. What does he accent in his fresh description of their past? Ephesians 2, 1 to 3, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses in sin, in which you once walked according to the course of 
of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. And we compare that with Ephesians 2, 11 and 12. Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Gentiles, who were now believers in Christ and members of his body, the church, were once totally separated from Israel and the salvation God offered. Paul judges it important for them to remember in verse 11 this past. They were then without Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah of Israel. They were aliens from the commonwealth, the state or people of Israel, and they were strangers from the covenants of promise, oblivious to the promises of salvation God had offered down through salvation history. The alienation from Israel and the salvation offered through it meant that they once had no hope and were without God in the world, as it said in verse 12. Also, in their past existence, Gentiles were caught up in a grand feud between themselves and the Jews. Paul gives a sense of this entrenched hatred by referring to one symptom of it, name-calling. Jews referred to Gentiles with derision as the uncircumcision, and Gentiles referred to Jews with equal disdain as the circumcision, in verse 11. Ephesians 2.13, however, points to something radically different now. Paul wrote, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. When Paul describes Gentile believers as once far off, he borrows from Isaiah 57.19, which reads, Peace, Peace to the far and to the near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. And we'll compare that with Ephesians 2, verses 17 and 18. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. In Christ and through his cross, Gentile believers had been brought near to all from which they were separated, God, hope, and their Jewish brothers and sisters. Here is the powerful good news implied by Paul's description, that the cross of Christ can heal the wide rift between Jews and Gentiles means that all of our feuds and divisions can be resolved here. This good news invites us to consider the divisions that exist in our own lives and in the church and to ponder the power of the cross to supersede them. And so to finish the day, from what condition has Jesus redeemed you? Why might it be important for you to recall with some regularity where you were when he found you and where you might be now had he not found you? Monday, July 24. Reconciliation, God's gift from the cross. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, that he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross. And that comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. How does Paul describe the cross and the impact of Christ's work there in each of these passages in Ephesians? How would you summarise what Paul says about the cross and how it transforms our relationships? And we have one, two, three, four, five passages to read here from the book of Ephesians. The first is Ephesians 1, verses 7 and 8. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, 
which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. And then chapter 4, verse 32, And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And then chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. And chapter 2, verse 16, And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And Ephesians 5 and verse 2, And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. And the same chapter, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. In the context of our passage for this week, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 22, the cross yields three great assets for believers. One, Gentiles who were far from God and his people are brought near, we read in verse 13, to both, being now sons and daughters of God and brothers and sisters of Jewish believers, we read in verse 19. Two, the hostility, the Greek word is ekthron or enmity, related to ekthros, enemy, between Jewish and Gentile believers is itself put to death in verse 16. The cross of Christ removes what seemed to be the permanent state of hostility and war in which Jews and Gentiles were sworn enemies, we read in verse 17. 3. In the place of hostility comes reconciliation. It was Christ's purpose to reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, in verse 16. And we'll compare that with Colossians 1, 19 and 22. But before that, let's read each of those texts we've just referred to. First of all, chapter 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And verse 19, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And verse 16, And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And verse 17, And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off, to those who were near. And we compare this with Colossians 1 verses 19 to 22. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. What does reconciliation look like? How does it feel to be reconciled? Imagine severe estrangement between a mother and and daughter, one that has settled in over a period of years. Imagine this rancor being dissolved in a wave of grace and forgiveness and the ensuing reunion between the two. That is reconciliation. Reconciliation is experienced in the moment when one church member lays aside whatever issues divide from another and acknowledges the other church member as a beloved brother or sister who accepts what has been offered. Reconciliation is not a mechanical or legal term, but an interpersonal one that celebrates the mending of broken relationships. Paul dares to imagine Christ's powerful work on the cross as impacting the relationships between not just individuals, but also people groups. He imagines it invading our lives and destroying our divisions, dissolving our quarrels and renewing our fellowship with and understanding of each other. And so to finish today, 
In what ways might you need to apply the principles here to be reconciled to someone else? How do you go about doing it? Tuesday, July 25. Breaking down the dividing wall. What action does Paul say Christ took toward the law of commandments expressed in ordinances? Why did he take this action? Let's look at Ephesians 2 verses 14 and 15. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Paul probably alludes here to the balustrade or fence that surrounded the court of Israel in Herod's temple with its death threat. Paul imagines this wall coming down and Gentiles being granted full access to worship God, as we read in Ephesians 2.18, for through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Any such wall, says Paul, is removed by the cross. For there we learn that these two peoples, Jews and Gentiles, are really one. Some believe that Ephesians 2.14 and 15 teaches that the Ten Commandments, inclusive of the Sabbath commandment, are abolished or set aside by the cross. However, in Ephesians, Paul demonstrates profound respect for the Ten Commandments as a resource for shaping Christian discipleship. He quotes the fifth commandment in Ephesians 6, 2 and 3. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And alludes to others, for example, the seventh in chapter 5, verses 3 to 14. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God." Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and having no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, and whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore he says, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. And verses 21 to 33. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So, husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh." This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the Church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. 
The eighth is found in Ephesians 4 verse 28. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labour working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. And the ninth we find in Ephesians 4 and verse 25. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbour, for we are members of one body. And Ephesians chapter 5 verse 5 is where he talks about the tenth. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. This aligns with Paul's earlier assertions about the law in Romans 3, 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. And Romans 7 and verse 12, Therefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Sorry for my um, neighbour mowing his lawn in the background. I've had a little break now. Let's continue. He addresses the misuse of the law, but he honours the law itself and assumes its continuity. Hence, to use these verses to abolish the Ten Commandments, especially in light of all the other verses in the Bible about the perpetuity of the law, is clearly a misrepresentation of Paul's intent here. Instead, any use of the law to drive a wedge between Jews and Gentiles, and especially to exclude Gentiles from full partnership among the people of God and access to worship, would be anathema to Paul and a misuse of the divine intention for the law. The law in Ephesians 2, 14 and 15 is either the ceremonial aspects of the law that divided Jew from Gentile, represented in Paul's complex phrase, the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, or it is the whole Old Testament system of law as it had come to be interpreted, augmented and misused as a wedge to distance Jews from Gentiles. And so to finish today, what tensions among Seventh-day Adventists or among members of the wider Christian community need to be confronted and overcome? Why should our common love of Christ be enough to overcome these tensions? Wednesday, July 26, Jesus, Preacher of Peace how does Paul summarise the ministry of Christ in Ephesians 2, verses 17 and 18? And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. The concept of peace is important in Ephesians, with the letter beginning and ending with blessings of peace from the Father our God and the Lord Jesus Christ in chapter 1 verse 2. We'll look at the last one in Ephesians 6.23, peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Earlier in Ephesians 2.11-22, Paul argues that Christ personifies peace, for he himself is our peace and that his cross creates it, we read in Ephesians 2, 14 to 16. Christ not only destroys something, the hostility between Jew and Gentile, referred to in verses 14 and 15, he creates a new humanity marked by relationships of reconciliation and peace, in verses 15 to 17. Such peace is not just the absence of of conflict, but resonates with the Hebrew concept of shalom, the experience of wholeness and well-being, both in our relationship with God and with others, as expressed in Romans 5 verse 1, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How does Paul imagine believers participating in sharing Jesus' message of peace? Well, we read in Ephesians 4 and verse 3, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of 
of peace. And then we compare Romans 10, 14 and 15 with some following verses. Romans 10, 14 and 15 reads, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings, of good things. And we compare that with Ephesians two seventeen to nineteen. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off, and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And Isaiah fifty two verse seven How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. And Isaiah 57 verse 19, I create the fruit of the lips, peace, peace to him who is far off and to him who is near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. The Gospels contain examples of Jesus as a preacher of peace. In his farewell messages to the disciples, he promised them and us, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, in John 14, verse 27. And he concludes, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world, in John 16, 33. After his resurrection, when he appears to the disciples, he repeatedly says to them, Peace be with you. And let's have a look at those verses in John 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And verse 21 So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father hath sent me, I also send you. And verse 26, And after eight days his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace to you. In Ephesians 2, 17 and 18, Paul is keen to point out that Christ's preaching of peace extended beyond the time of his earthly ministry. He has preached peace in the present to both far Gentile believers before they were converted and near Jewish believers. We'll compare that in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Having accepted this proclamation, all believers experience a profound blessing. And so to finish today, how can we learn to be preachers of peace as opposed to conduits of conflict? To what situations right now can you help bring healing? Thursday, July 27, The Church, A Holy Temple What culminating set of images does Paul use in Ephesians 2, 11-22 to signal unity between Jews and Gentiles in the Church? Well, let's read the whole passage again. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. 
for he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off, and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Reviewing Ephesians 2, we recall that verses 1 to 10 teach that we live in solidarity with Jesus, while verses 11 to 22 teach that we live in solidarity with others as part of his church. Jesus' death has both vertical benefits in establishing our relationship with God in verses 1 to 10 and horizontal ones in cementing our relationships with others in 11 to 22. Through the cross, Jesus demolishes all that divides Gentile believers from Jewish ones, including the misuse of the law, in order to widen the gulf, as expressed in verses 11 to 18. Jesus also builds something, an amazing new temple composed of believers. Gentiles, once excluded from worship in the sacred place of the temple, now join Jewish believers in becoming a new temple. We all become part of God's church, a holy temple in the Lord, as we read in Ephesians 2, 19-22, and are privileged to live in solidarity with Jesus and our brothers and sisters in Christ. How does Paul's use of the metaphor of the church as a temple in Ephesians 2, 19-22 compare with the uses in the following passages? And we'll look at these, 1 Corinthians 3, 9 to 17, for we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work, of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, for he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are." And 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through to chapter 7, verse 1. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness, and what accord has Christ with Belial, or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord God Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God.
and 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 8, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also are living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offence. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. Paul employs the metaphor of the church as temple as a culminating image for the full inclusion of Gentiles in the church. Once banned from worship in the court of Israel, in the temple, they now not only gain access, in verse 18, but themselves become building materials for a new temple designed as a dwelling place of God in the Spirit, in verse 22. New Testament authors employ the temple metaphor to visualise the sanctity of the church. God's role in founding and growing the church and the solidarity of believers within the church. The metaphor is used in conjunction with biological language, as we see in chapter 2, verse 21, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, where the temple grows, and the process of building is often accentuated in verse 22, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. You are also built together. Rather than a static image, the church is able to acknowledge its identity as it says in 2 Corinthians 6.16, the temple of the living God. Friday, July 28. Study carefully the following preamble to the discussion questions listed below. What is the specific context in which Paul writes Ephesians 2, 11-22, as he describes the sweeping effects of the cross on human relationships? He is addressing the relationships between Jewish and Gentile believers who together are members of the church. He expresses an obvious concern that they understand and live their shared, reconciled status as fellow members of God's household. However, in the context of the letter as a whole, Paul demonstrates a broad, far-reaching purpose. His theme is God's grand ultimate plan to unite all things in Christ. And his scope includes every family in heaven and on earth, as it says in Ephesians 3, verse 15. More important, the unity of members within the church, the specific topic he addresses in chapter 2, verses 11 to 22, itself has a wider purpose than Paul discloses in chapter 3, verse 10, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God, in creating the church out of both Jews and Gentiles, might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Through actualizing the unity Christ won on the cross, believers are to signal that God's ultimate plan to unite all things in Christ is underway. Their reconciled relationships signal God's plan for a universe unified in Christ. So it is appropriate to look at Ephesians 2, 11 to 22, set in the context of Ephesians as a whole, for biblical principles concerning a topic of importance today, relationships among people, groups or races. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. What biblical principles concerning ethnic relations are provided in Ephesians 2, 11 to 22? How does the passage offer a distinctive, Christ-centred approach to the theme of how members of one ethnic group should relate to members of another? 2. 
Given God's plan for the future of mankind, as we read in, during the lesson in Ephesians 1, 9 and 10 and Ephesians 2, 11 to 22, how important is it for the church to deal with its own internal issues and conflicts between races? And three, what simmering issues between ethnic groups, which all too often may be hidden and ignored, exist in your community? How might your church play a positive role in actualising the unifying work Christ already has accomplished on the cross? How might you participate in that work? And for today's Inside Story, here's Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. Safe in Jesus, Part 2 by Andrew McChesney One afternoon, 16-year-old Almira decided to take a nap after returning home from school, exhausted from months of fitful nights. She lay down on a couch, her face to the open door of the room. She was at home alone. Suddenly, she sensed the presence in the room. Looking toward the door, she saw the presence for the first time. He looked like a grey cloud completely obscuring the doorway. Almira didn't know why, but she understood that something terrible would happen if she even blinked. She stared at the doorway for what seemed an eternity. Finally, she had to blink. In that split second, the grey cloud darted to her. Almira felt like she was entombed in a giant stone, helpless and unable to move. She struggled to breathe. She pleaded with good forces to help, but there was no response. At that moment, she remembered a prayer that she had memorised. It was a non-Christian prayer associated with her ancestors' traditional religion. She recited it. For a moment, she was free and could breathe, but then the presence captured her again. She repeated the prayer again and again. She was released and recaptured, released and recaptured. Growing weary of the struggle, she frantically wondered what she could do to save herself. Abruptly, she remembered that one of the Russian teachers at the supernatural courses had mentioned Jesus Christ was more powerful than all good and evil forces. The thought flashed into her mind to call upon Jesus. She opened her mouth to speak. She only managed to utter the first syllable of Jesus' name, and the grey cloud fled. She felt as though Jesus had entered the room and thrown the evil captor off her. Almira had no doubt that she needed Jesus. But how? She was not a Christian. So she went to her ancestors' traditional place of worship for two months. She began to sleep better. So she decided that Jesus must also visit that place of worship. Then her older sister, Fania, came home with two friends whom Almira had never seen before. She learned that day that Fania had started going to a Seventh-day Adventist church located on the same street as their apartment building. The two friends were members of the Adventist church. Almira related her story to the Adventist girls. That is Satan, one girl said. The other girl said Almira had entered Satan's territory by taking the classes on the supernatural. But Jesus is on your side, she said. Only he can free you from Satan's power. We will read more about Almira next week. Thank you for your mission offerings that help spread the gospel in Russia and around the world. Greetings, Sabbath School friends around the world. My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Kurumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath School lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born initially read as Eyes for the Visually Impaired through Christian Services for the Blind in Australia and New Zealand. It became a podcast in July 2007, and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app, with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcasts of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. For several years, it has also been available in a YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. 
and for the visually impaired in the North American Division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favorite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Cyberschool app is a sure way to listen daily. That is the one with the blue rectangular icon, with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, remember, God is always faithful.